so moving on to the first one i'm sorry here you can see the networking technologies so uh, i'm starting with the 2g and 4g the evolution happens in such a way that we will be having a demand for increased data increased data access and a better quality so that is the main objective why everybody moves on to the 2g from 4g and also why it is required we will be uh, checking in the further slides so here you can see the very first uh, i mean i'm not showing here the 1g that is the analog technology it is nothing but the amps we used to have then the 2g comes with the gsm and then moving on further it was with 2.5g 3g and 4g so here uh the two i mean the gsm the 2g it just supports the gsm speech we will be able to transmit only the voice calls nothing nothing else than the speech then with the circuit switched data services we were able to access sms which is nothing but the short message service and then when the high circuit or high speed circuit switched data when it is implemented we were able to get the location based services with the high circuit switch data speed so combining all these things we were able to transmit only the data services but not on a higher data rate and that is the reason to access the internet to get information with wide worldwide networks we really need to have the gprs facility included then that is the reason we were migrating from 2g to 2.5g wherein only the gprs was included so when i talk about gsm technology it is completely a 2.5g technology wherein we have the basic gsm services along with the gprs included in that so here comes the gprs so gprs has the wap and then the mms facilities i mean i'm just showing the examples just to project what is gprs and gsm so in the wap you will be able to access the uh, i mean the urls and other things mms is nothing but the uh, multiple message uh, multimedia messaging services and other things so combining all together we have the gsm and then when we really wanted to move to 3g we have the umts and in 4g we have lte so how this really happens we will be able to see in the next slides again i'll come back to the same slide so that it will be easy to have a better understanding so why exactly we need to migrate to 3g and 4g the 2g and the 2.5g systems what we are currently having are not so compatible around the world so we need to have the single technology in which the single device will be able to work anywhere across the globe so when we start when we talk about the 2.5g or the 2g standards they are not completely internationalized with the other 3g or 4g compatibilities and also to have a single standard which has to be accepted around the world we need the 3g so with 3g we will be having the better access and availability to more information because in 3g what happens is like we will be able to access the real time networks with a higher speed with higher access and higher quality that is the main thing apart from the technical details like how the bandwidth is enhanced how the data rate is enhanced all those things i'm i'm just giving the brief outline why we need the 3g to 4g so the main thing is access to information from any place any time and to get in sync with the global environment we need to be compatible with the globalized standards to be in merge with the other technologies to have our devices compatible across the globe so that is the main thing why we are migrating so again the 3g and 2g when we compare this is the i mean as usual we know the higher speed and higher quality so moving further to 4g what happens is like we have a higher bandwidth better response time that is 10 times better than 3g which is working at 2.6 gigahertz frequency with a better coverage but when you talk about the components the 4g is using the same receiver and transmitter i mean the tower components as the 3g but one thing is we need to upgrade the towers for the 4g components so we are not going to modify the complete infrastructure for a 4g network wherein we have some modifications involved in 4g also but at the same time the cost cutting is going to be minimal but we are going to enhance the technology for a better use so apart from this when we talk about the pros and cons uh, obviously we have so many advantages but the disadvantages would be the cost the prices 
the availability of all the mobile phones in different parts of the world. That's the thing because when in India, as you see, the 4G is not yet evolved completely, but we keep talking that we are migrating to 3G and 4G. So that is the bigger, bigger con, I could say. Then moving further to the network technologies, we have. No, I mean, I'm going to analyze here GSM, UMTS, and LTE. I'm going to highlight the differently. So it's not going to be the complete networking architecture in detail. We talk about it, but I'm going to highlight how GSM works, how UMTS, UMTS works, how LTE works, and what are the major differences between each of them. How the infrastructure is different for each of them. What exactly the protocols are differing, all those kind of things, along with the interfaces. So the first one would be the GSM. So GSM is nothing but the global system for mobile communications. It's a digital cellular technology which is categorized under 2.5G. As we were seeing in the previous slides, the evolution. So you will be able to see how the evolution happened. Like from 2G to 2.5, we have a basic circuit switched data. Along with that, we are going to have the HSCST. And then we are inputting the GP address. Then all together we have the 2.5G, in which the basic GSM facilities for the call and data services are transmitted. Then, as as we discussed, it supports the voice call and data transfer speeds up to 9.6 kbps together with the transmission of SMS. Why here it is mentioned as SMS is that initially. But when the GSM was launched, it was providing better voice quality. But when GPRS was included, we were able to achieve all the GPRS as well as the GSM services. Then the access method is nothing but the time division multiple access. So I could say it is a basic multiple access. I mean, it is a basic access method in which the access is through the time slots. As everybody might be knowing, what is TDMA, FDMA, and other things. I'm not going to highlight so much on that. But the access method would be time division multiple access. So we are going to check what are the access methods involved in UMTS and other things also. So here is the architecture. So we have, a, a, I could see, I could say we have a, a BSS. I mean, I'm splitting it into two basic components. One is the BSS and NSS. So BSS is nothing but the base station subsystem, and NSS is nothing but the net, uh, network subsystem, a uh, network station subsystem. So completely what happens is like you have a NMS, NMS is nothing but network management system which categorizes or which takes care of the complete NSS in cooperation with the BSS. So here we can see the subscriber identity module which is nothing but your SIM. Then you have the BTS, BSC, mobile switching center, HLR, VLR and the PSTN network. So starting by one by one, SIM is nothing but your, I mean, subscriber identity module, it is nothing but a chip which has got its proprietary files to communicate to the network. So basically when you talk about, in, in the case of GSM, KI, KC or whatever it is for the authentication purposes which is sent by this, which is the communication between, I mean, we have different kind of communication levels. One is between the SIM to mobile, that is the handset. And again, you have the complete mobile equipment along with the SIM to your network. So here you will be able to see the SIM and, the, and your mobile equipment communicating to the BTS. So your BTS is nothing but the base transceiver station, that is your tower, whatever the network may be. And then comes under the BSC. BSC is the base station controller. So the base station controller controls all the BTS together. Say for example, OK, let's move to MSC, then we can see the example. So MSC is the mobile switching center. We can also say that master switching center because all the control comes under the MSC, the user plane, the control plane, all the call activities, session management, everything is carried out by MSC. So what exactly the MSC does is when, when suppose there is a person who is in, say for example in Chennai, who wants to communicate to person B in another, another area, another location of Chennai. Then what happens is like through the MSC to MSC, the communication is handled. That is how the call 
the isoprol basically carries out. Then we have the HLR and VLR. HLR is nothing but the home location register which contains all the databases of the subscribers. For example, if it is a, if, if you take a Vodafone network, then the HLR will contain all the subscriber details in HLR. And VLR would be the visitor, visitor location register, which is nothing but whenever there is an entry from one, one subscriber to, I mean, whenever there is a subscriber entering from one location to another location, the VLR takes care of it, mapping the information, I mean, the checking the information with respect to the HLR. So how this happens basically, this VLR plays a major role when in the case of roaming. But in general cases, this is how the basic architecture is and we have different interfaces. When I say interfaces, it's nothing but how one component talks to the another component. That is, that is what we call as interface. Why we need an interface? Because say for example, when DTS talk to DLC, it may not be the same level of communication what BSC is handling with MSC. And that is why we need interfaces and that is why we need protocols and that is why we need gateways. So here you, you can see the uh, normal uh, subscriber identity module with the mobile equipment. On the other side you have your PSTN network. So let's take two cases. One is the normal mobile call which is handled. So what happens, say so for example, when a person in Chennai is trying to call a person B in Bangalore, what happens? Basically, two different kind of networks are going to talk between each other. That means uh, the Chennai Airtel network can be able to talk to Bangalore Vodafone network. But as you see, the networking architecture could be the same, but when we talk about in the aspect of mobile operators, the components might be different because Sometimes they may use the Ericsson components, sometimes they may use the Nokia components. We are not sure about what exactly happens inside the MSC server. So in those cases, we really need a gateway which will be common to two different networks, which will be able to handle the communication between two different networks. And that is why we have the GMSC, and GMSC is nothing but the gateway MSC. So the gateway MSC will be able to route the calls depending on which MSC it has to route the call. That is the major role of this GMSC. And when we talk about PST network, obviously it is going to be a public switch telephone network. It is completely a different network rather than the GSM. So obviously we need a gateway to communicate between the major, the main MSC and the other world. I mean to say the external uh, network. So that is how it happens. And why we have OMC, why we need network management center? Basically, when there is a live network, say for example, uh, Odafone, then what, ha what happens exactly is that we need to keep monitoring the live network in order to reduce the congestion, in order to reduce the traffic payload and other things. Why? Because in order to have a seamless connection, we need to have a continu continuous transmission of whatever it is, I mean to say the voice of data. So depending on that, to make your network to be enhanced, to provide a better you know, service and other things, we need a monitoring center wherein it will be keep on monitoring the complete network. So when we talk about the network management center, it could be different. I, I mean, for NSS there would be a different uh, OMC, for BSS it would be a different OMC and other things. ONC is nothing but the operation and maintenance center. So this is how the basic uh, architecture of GSM where, wherein the call connectivity happens. Apart from this, here is another component also which I didn't include because I really wa don't want to confuse much. Uh, it is a virtual MSC. Basically when there is a call congestion, say for example when your network is completely loaded. For example, there is a festival on uh, January 1st, for example, New Year, then at 12 o'clock it is obvious that everybody will be trying to reach other. So there could be a possibility, higher possibility that your network can get congested. So at that point of time, you really need to release some of the carriers to transmit your data or to your voice. So what happens is like, we create a virtual MSC wherein we create some circuits. When I say circuits, it's nothing but the even link carriers. Then we make the routing to be done as such, the traffic is not getting congested. So, so this is how the basic GSM architecture works.
and the, you can see the AUC uh, that is authentication center, equipment ID, so on. So what exactly it refers to? When you have your mobile, when you have your SIM, you will be having a unique components, for example, the IMEI number and the EMC. So IMEI is nothing but your handset number, international mobile equipment identity, and EMC is nothing but the unique number assigned for your SIM, that is international mobile subscriber identity. So these two things has to be authenticated through the AUC, wherein this AUC takes care of so many operations like uh, algorithms, encryption and decryption, authentication, etc. So it's really, really a big process what exactly happens inside this EIR and EIUR, etc. But the outline is such that the call connectivity happens in this way for a normal, the same network and to another network. So moving further, here you have the UMTS. 